Good News Book, Chapter 15, Joanna, Wife of Chusa. And I think that it's a, a question we should be asking ourselves is, you know, why this spirit gets a whole chapter in this um, beautiful book. And I think as we read the story tonight, it will unfold why that is. But just a little bit of um, background information. So who is Joanna? Um, and just to start out, it's interesting to note in the Catholic Church, she's considered a saint and um, for anointing medals and for desperate cases. So her feast day is May 24th. And if you're Lutheran, it's August 3rd. Her name is Hebrew and it means God is gracious. There are some scholars that believe she is the granddaughter of a high priest, Theophilus. Uh, she was born around the same time as Jesus, so about the same age. I couldn't locate an exact date of her birth, but um, they just all said the same time as Jesus. It is, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you want to put the, your entry presentation mode? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, all right. So also we should know about Joanna. She was at the foot of the cross with Mary during the crucifixion of Jesus. She was with Mary Magdalene at the tomb of Jesus's resurrection. She was also present at the Pentecost um, after Jesus's resurrection when the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles. Um, Joanna was one of the people involved in electing Matthias to fill the role of, um, or the spot after Judas uh, discarnated. And she was also one of the wealthy women that supported Jesus and the apostles and she traveled around with them. So fast forward uh, more recently, she is um, in her book, after the storm, which is um, uh, psychographed by Divaldo Franco. It's called After the Storm. She confirms that she was part of the team of the Spirit of Truth um, that um, Kardec has uh, received messages for the gospel. And I know there's some controversy. Some people say the Spirit of Truth was only Jesus, and some people say it was a collection of spirits. So. The information I've had was that it's a collection of spirits and she was one of them. Um, she's also in the gospel known as a friendly spirit. There are two messages in the gospel according to spiritism received by Joanna um, that are, is signed a friendly spirit. One is in um, chapter nine on item seven on patience. And then there's another one in chapter 18, item 13 and 15. He who already has more will be given more. That's also signed by a friendly spirit, which is her. So she is one of um, the spirit guides. Yeah. To, she's one of the spirit guides to De, De Valdo Franco um, since 1956. I also think it's really just briefly to look at some of her incarnations. Uh, at the time of uh, St. Francis of Assisi, so that was about the 1100s, she was in Italy and she was uh, a follower of Claire of Assisi, who was kind of the counterpart to Francis of Assisi. So she was a nun and they had written the first um, rule written by a woman. So these rules at that time were just like guidelines they would follow for conduct. And so she was involved with that. In Mexico in the 1600s, she was known as um, Juana Inez de la Cruz. And again, she's a nun. She defended women's rights and she died from the plague while helping others. Another incarnation was in Brazil in the 1700s where she's known as Joana Angelica de Jesus. And again, she's a nun and she was killed by a soldier while barring the convent from attack. So just as we start to go into the story, just to get our bearings a little bit. Um, so she was born at the time of Jesus and there's some overlap with um, Paul of Tarsus because he was four BC to like 64 AD. 
he was converted in 33 AD. So just to get a bearing on where we are in the history. And I was really hoping, I think it's important to read the whole story. I don't wanna just pull out parts of it. So I'm hoping people will volunteer and read, take turns reading the slides. Um, so here we go. Can someone read? I'll start. Amongst the crowd that invariably followed Jesus in his preachings at the lake, there was always a woman of rare dedication and noble character who came from Capernaum, high, Capernaum's high society. She was Joanna, the wife of Cusa, steward of Antipas in the city where vital interests of mer merchants and fishermen merged together. Okay. So what we can see here is that her husband is, and so it's Kuza with a hard C, not C-H, Kuza, is that? I think, I think that's how you pronounce it, yes. Yeah, okay, I was saying Chuza. <laughs> All right, so Kuza, and he's a steward, which is basically a um, property manager for Herod Antipas. So this is a well-paid position. They are of the wealthy class, and even though they are Jewish, um, they're you know, considered high society or wealthy. So they're not liked uh, among the commoners. I think that's an important thing to make. And then here we have a map just to get our bearings of um, the time of Jesus. So Herod of Antipas, he was the ruler of Galilee and Perea, which you can see on the map. And he, um, so Antipas is just a nickname he was given. It means um, for all or against all. And I, there, I couldn't find any story as to why that was a nickname for him. But um, he was also known as Herod Tetrarch, which just simply means ruler of a quarter. Because this land that we're looking at, this whole map, was the area that his father, who was Herod, uh, King Herod, the great King Herod, um, ruled all this land. And then when he died, he uh, divided it in four between him and his brothers. So we should remember and be able to distinguish King Herod was the king at the time of Jesus's birth that was killing all the children because he knew there was a king that was gonna be born and he you know, wanted to make sure no one got his power. So that's his father. And then, um, and his half brother, Philip. So just to quickly, I think most of us know the story, but just to quickly um, recap. Uh, so Herod Antipas married his half brother's uh, wife, Herodias, and John the Baptist was very, um, uh, uh, you know, talk against this and made it known that he, it was immoral and that he, you know, it was not right. So Herodias, the wife wanted vengeance on John the Baptist. So during one of Herod's um, birthday parties, he said he would grant his stepdaughter Salome, Salome, a wish and um, the mother encouraged the daughter to ask for um, John the Baptist's head. And so right there in the party, he had John the Baptist beheaded. And there's um, some thought that Joanna was at this gathering and she was actually the person who retrieved the head out of a dung pile and then buried it. And so, you know, we also know uh, from the gospel, um, the Bible, that Jesus had healed um, her and some of the other women from these demon spirits. So we can maybe just um, conclude, you know, perhaps this might have, you know, knocked her a little bit out of balance being at this uh, tragic event. And yeah. So the other key thing to think about here is so say, uh, Joanna is, uh, you know, living in this household and, and, you know, they, she has easy access to all of Herod's um, uh, complex. So uh, 
it, it's also thought that she is one of the resources that provided the information for the people who wrote the gospel in the Bible, that provided the information about what actually happened in Herod's court during Jesus's um, trials. Um, it, it's also um, verified in some of the other books that she was converting people in his household. You know, she was sharing the gospel. Um, there's one story in um, Jesus in the Home. Uh, I believe it's chapter 31. It's, uh, that's by the spirit Neo Lucio and Chico uh, psychographed it. And there, it, the chapter is on pain. It's, um, and it says that one of um, Ch uh, Cusa's servants by the name Rachel was there uh, asking Jesus why there's pain in the world. So we can see from that. And then also in the good news, uh, in a later chapter, Jesus is talking to um, Peter, Simon Peter, about Joanna spreading the good news within Herod's uh, household. So just to recap as we go into the story, um, so Tiberius is the Roman emperor at this time, and Pontius Pilate is the governor, and then Herod Antipas is actually the ruler where uh, the story is taking place. Okay, so if someone will read the next slide. Joanna had had true faith. However, she failed to, let me just see. Uh, she, she failed to secure herself from domestic sorrows because her spouse did not accept the enlightenment of the gospel. Given her intimate troubles, the noble woman searched for the Messiah at the time he rested at Simon's house. Then she shared with the Messiah the long litany of her hardships and sufferings. Okay, so here we see that um, they mentioned that Joanna had true faith. And so Kardec tells us about true faith in the gospel, uh, according to Spiritism in chapter 19, item three. He says that uh, he gives us a description of true faith and that there's calmness in the midst of struggle, which is a sign of confidence and knowing obstacles can be overcome is another sign of true faith and certainty and strength. Um, so this part about knowing obstacles can be overcome and certainty is really key in, in having true faith. But there's also humility in that one is trusting in God, but they realize that the source of the power is from God, not from themselves. Um, there's also patience with love. So it's like knowing how to wait. Um, he contrasts true faith with a faltering faith, which is uncertainty and hesitation. So there's a lack of confidence. And we can kind of look to maybe like Nicodemus as an example of this. He knew Jesus was the Messiah, but he, he was hesitant. He was, uh, you know, he, he couldn't see how he as a high priest could follow Jesus. He also talks, uh, Kardec talks about presumptuous faith, which here there's a certainty, but this certainty comes from pride. It's thinking that I'm the source of power, not that there's a source higher than me. And so an example of this type of faith could be seen with Judas. Um, and you'll see that um, as you, in the later chapters in this book where um, uh, Judas, he loves the Messiah uh, and he believes the Messiah, but he thinks he has a better way, that he's not so sure Jesus is gonna be able to pull it off and he actually thinks he's helping Jesus. So we also see with true faith, Kardec says that there's a special application with magnetic action when one has true faith. So having true faith um, complemented with a good will um, affects the universal fluid. And this produces the phenomena of healing. So this is what Jesus was doing with his true faith, goodwill, and was able to affect the universal fluids when he was curing and healing people. And so, and in the Bible, they, they talk about them as 
uh, miracles, but as um, spiritists, we know that there are no such miracles, that um, they are explainable and they do fall within the natural law. And if anybody wants to read more, I'm sure you're all aware, it's, you would look in the book Genesis to read about that. Um, also in this section in True Faith in the Gospel, um, Kardec received a message from a protector spirit named Joseph in 1862. And he says that true faith is contagious and the way we spread it is through our actions. And he just reminds us that it's not preaching, but rather how we live. Um, so I think what we can conclude from this slide, Joanna having true faith is most likely she was a healer. Um, can someone read? Her husband did not tolerate the doctrine of the master. Herod's high official, who was in constant contact with the representatives of the empire, dispensed his religion preferences sometimes with either the interests of the Jewish community or with Roman gods, which allowed him to live in easy and profitable tranquility. Okay, so I think it's a good moment to talk about the, this um, era, this culture. And so we need to understand that women were not highly regarded at this time. So the idea of a woman complaining about her husband or even going to, uh, especially to another man, this is like not acceptable. Um, and to, to realize that uh, one reference said, you know, women at that time were regarded like children. So like their word was not considered to be anything of substance and they were just pretty much disregarded. Um, I also wanna bring up the maxim that's in the gospel that where Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, but division. It's in chapter 23. So what we see here is kind of a flip-flop of kind of ideas, so to speak. You know, the Jewish people were expecting a king, they were expecting a Messiah, but they thought, you know, he's gonna come in robes, he's gonna be rich, he's gonna have a strong army and he's gonna overtake the Romans. And this is not what Jesus did. Um, also, you know, even accepting Jesus as a Messiah, they were still baffled. Why was he hanging out with tax collectors and these people of high society and these wayward women, you know? so. Um, it's also interesting that um, the people who first received the message of his resurrection were women. And so it's not that Jesus was like, women are better than men, but it was more of he knew the value of the feminine qualities and the feminine characteristics, which, which were totally being disregarded at that time. Um, in our daily bread on uh, chapter 93 by Emmanuel, um, psychographed by Chico, Emmanuel says that Jesus is the first true feminist. And we need to remember here, he's not talking about female or male. He's not talking about gender, but more the feminine and masculine qualities. Um, and so, and it's also that idea of the balance of those qualities. And so also, as you get further along in this book on chapter 22, it, it's about Mary Magdalene. Jesus ta is talking to the disciples and he tells them, you know, you've got to get rid of these old beliefs because um, in the eyes of God, we're all equal. And um, I think what's important for us to think about is um, of course, the qualities of feminine and masculine, but, you know, as we are in this incarnation is a male or female is what, you know, what are the missions? What is the mission as, you know, as a female? What is it that um, I may need to learn, experience, relinquish, whatever? Um, and then I just want to say for this last part, uh, you know, they're pointing, what's being brought out here by Humberto de Campos is that um, her husband was a materialist. You know, they, they both, they were Jewish, um, but he wasn't, you know, really committed to his uh, scripture or his doctrine. Um, 
he he was really into physical comforts and you know wherever he could get that the romans the jewish that's you know the way he was going so he was a self-serving man okay can someone read Joanna confessed to the master her fears, her struggles and dislikes in the domestic environment, exposing her bitterness in regard to the religious differences existing between her and her companion. After listening to her long enunciation, Jesus pondered. Okay, so here I think the only, I, I think one of the important things is to recognize Jesus's emotional management that he, he listens to her intently, he doesn't interrupt, and he ponders, he's not impulsive. Can someone read? Joanna, there, there is only one God that is our father, and there is only one faith in our relationship with his love. Certain religious manifestations in the world are often just popular vices in the form of external rituals. All the temples of earth are made of stone. I come in the name of God to open the temple of living faith in the hearts of human beings. The bloodless battle of spiritual redemption begins between the sincere disciple of the gospel and the millennial errors of the world. Be thankful to the Father, for he has judged you worthy of the good work from now on. Doesn't your spouse understand the sen your sensitive soul? He will understand you someday. Is, is he reckless and indifferent? Love him anyway. You wouldn't be connected to him if there was no fair reason for that. You will be fulfilling the will of, the, the will of good by serving him with loving dedication. Okay, so there's a lot there, um, but in the middle of the paragraph where it says the bloodless battle of spiritual redemption, we can understand this to mean determined effort to get out of ignorance. So next Jesus says in here that um, your husband doesn't understand you, he will someday. And I think here he's alluding to the idea that we always progress, right? We don't regress. So someday her, he will understand. Um, I think also a, a good thing to um, a message here is the idea that it's important for us to accept that we're gonna be misunderstood, that it's important for us to actually progress to accept this, that we are gonna be misunderstood and in this, there's two different chapters in this book where um, Jesus exemplifies that. Uh, one is in chapter 10 on forgiveness where he and the disciples go to Nazareth and the disciples are debating and they even get caught up in debates with uh, the, the, the crowd and it's starting the, to intensify in the chaos and Jesus orders them to leave. And they're like, we don't get it. You know, we should do this. We should, you know, prove our point. And he tells them, Debate is fruitless, you know, it, you, it, you know, yeah. And then the other uh, one is where Thomas actually comes to him and says, you know, listen, why don't you go, this was in chapter 16, he says, why don't you go to the high priest and, you know, show them the miracles, then they'll know you're the Messiah. And, and both times he understands that he's being misunderstood and he tells Thomas, no, because the gospel is not for the officials, it's not to impress them. So Jesus exemplified that he knew he was understood, you know, and he was, he, he let, you know, he, he walked away in silence. So um, I also think another point in here toward the end where he talks about, you wouldn't be connected to him if there was no fair reason. So here we see Jesus alluding to reincarnation, the idea of cause and effect, um, that um, we're, there's nothing, <clears throat> nothing is happening by a chance. Okay, so can someone read? I can. You talk to me about your fears and doubt. Based on the gospel, you should love him even more. 
the healthy do not need a physician. Moreover, we cannot harvest grapes in the breers, but we can cultivate the soil that produced poison thistles in order to grow there a wonderful vine of love and life. Next. I can. In the soft glow of her eyes, Joanna let show the inner satisfaction that those clarifications brought to her. But, revealing the true state of her soul, she asked, Master, your word soothes my troubled spirit. However, I face extreme difficulty in regard to mutual understanding at home. Wouldn't you think it right that I fight to impose your principles? In doing so, would I not be renewing my husband for heaven and your kingdom? Okay. And someone else? Christ serenely smiled and replied, Who would face more difficulty in extending fraternal hands? Would it be the one who reached the safe boundaries of knowledge with the Father, or the one who is still struggling within the waves of ignorance, or of desolation, of fickleness, or indolence, indolence of the spirit? All right. So here, you know, Jesus is making a wise point, like, it's going to be way harder for her husband. He's not interested in the gospel. He, you know, he's not asking for her help or advice. And he, he's surrounded right now with, you know, physical comforts. Um, he's into material passions. So, and on the other hand, Joanna, who, you know, is wanting to transform herself. She's traveling around with Christ. She's attending these teachings. You know, she's um, surrounded with other, you know, Christians, I guess they weren't called Christians yet. Um, and I, I think for us, though, it's a good thing to um, remember when, you know, you come up, up against somebody and you think, why don't they get this? Or, you know, we have kind of an agenda for somebody else. We, we think we know how they should be. And, you know, it's, it's good for us to remember, yeah, we go to these spiritual centers, well, we did, uh, but we, you know, we still get together on Zoom and study and we read these books and we listen to these lectures and yeah, so, you know, but somebody who's in the thick of it, it's going to be really hard. So uh, it's a good message for us. And um, so I think that it's that idea of meeting people where they're at instead of, you know, having demands. Um, also, when we were talking about not being understood, you know, I, I think about that. And so often it's like I, when I'm having trouble communicating and I, I keep wanting to explain myself, and I'm sure most of you have experienced this, it gets worse. The more I explain myself, the, the, you know, the less they understand me and it can build into anger and resentment. So anyway, um, all right. So can someone else read the next one? Regarding the imposition of ideas, Jesus continued, stressing the importance of his words. I ask you why God does not impose his truth and love to the tyrants of the earth. Why doesn't he strike dead the heartless conqueror, spreading misery and destruction with the sinister forces of war? Heavenly wisdom does not exterminate passions. It transforms them. The one who sowed the world with corpses awakes sometimes to God through a simple tear. The father does not impose reform on his children. He sheds light onto them at the opportune moment. Okay, so then we see here Jesus reminding us not to impose, not to make demands on other people, because whatever that demand is, or whatever we're trying to impose can actually create an aversion and push the person in the other direction. So we need to remember to assist people 
instead of making demands um, or having an agenda. Next one. Joanna, the, the ministry of the gospel is the collaboration with heaven in the great principles of redemption. Be faithful to God by loving your spouse in the world as if he were your son. Do not waste time in discussing what is unreasonable. God does not fight. Go. Strive in, in silence and when called for clarification, speak the sweet or energetic word of salvation according to the circumstances. Go back home and love your partner as the divine material that heaven has put into your hands so that you may whittle a piece of life, wisdom, and love. Joanna, wife of Chusa, Kyuza, uh, experienced a mild relief in her heart, addressing Jesus with a look of affectionate gratitude. She still heard his last words, go, my dear, be faithful. Okay. And I think you might have missed a sentence in there where it says, God does not fight battles with his children, but he works in silence, reaching all of his creation. Um, so this is the end of part one. And what we see here is Jesus is presenting her with a plan um, of conduct on how to live life with resignation. Um, and in the gospel, according to Spiritism, chapter nine, number eight, Kardec um, differenti differentiates for us resignation versus obedience. And he says that resignation is the consent of the heart so it's a knowing through the feeling that something is the best way versus obedience, which is consent with reason. And this is understanding something is the best way. So one re resignation is working more with the heart, the feeling, and obedience is working more with the mind and reasoning. Um, Jesus also mentions here collaboration, which we can understand as cooperation. And in um, Emmanuel's Thought and Life book, chapter three, he explains to us about cooperation. And he reminds us that we can't uh, progress by ourselves. So like cooperation is necessary. So it's not surprising that, you know, Jesus is telling her to go back and be with her husband and essentially learn how to cooperate. Um, Cooperation comes from inner silence, and it's using our will and cooperating with others. So it is a directed use of our will. And when we do this with other people, it creates harmony. The other thing is when we cooperate, it's also a way of being other-centered. Um, so in true cooperation, it's considering the other person instead of what we want or our agenda. So at the end there too, where he says, whittle a piece of life, wisdom, and love. Here, I believe Jesus is reminding us that we're co-creators with God. So he's pretty much telling her like, go, go create something good. Okay. Can someone read? Since the memorable day in her life, the wife of Kuza experienced in her soul the constant clarity of re resignation, always ready for the good work and always active to understand God. As the master's teaching was now indelibly printed in her soul, she considered that before being a wife on the earth, she was a daughter of that father in heaven that knew her generosity and sacrifice. Her spirit shone a sacred and hidden light in everything she did. Okay, so from this paragraph, we, we learned that Joanna is clearly planted in the first commandment, which is love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul above all else. And this, you can read about this in the, um, the gospel as well in chapter 15. And then if someone else can read. 
She made efforts to forget all of her husband's inferior characteristics and only focused on the good ones. At the slightest opportunity, she would support the embryonic development of his faltering eternal virtues. Later, Evan sent her a little boy whose presence doubled her work. However, she never forgot Jesus' recommendations on faithfulness, and she turned her pain into a silent hymn of triumph every day. Someone else, please read. Years went by, and Joanna's persevering efforts multiplied her assets of faith in the arduous march of knowledge and life. Political persecution shattered the way of life for her companion. Joanna, however, remained firm. Tortured by hateful ideas of revenge and insolent debt, insolvent debts, by hurt vanity and by diseases that corroded his body, the former quartermaster of Antipas returned to the spiritual plane in a stormy night of shadows. Thank you. Can someone else read? His wife, however, endured the bitter, bitterest disappointments, faithful to her divine ideals built on sincere trust. Pressed by tough needs, the noble woman of Capernaum sought after work to make ends meet with the little boy that God had entrusted to her. Some friends chided her for working taken in by conventions of human respect. Joanna, however, tried to explain to them that Jesus had also worked, callousing his hands with the saws of a modest profession in carpentry. She continued that by submitting herself to a position of inferiority in the world. She could primarily devote herself to Christ as a devoted slave. Thanks. Can someone else read? Filled with sincere joy, the widow of Cusa forgot the comfort of the material nobility. She devoted herself to the children of other mothers. She busied herself with the most menial household chores so that her little boy had bread. Later, when the snow of the experiences of the world colored in white the first waves of hair on her head. A Roman galley took her as a humble servant. Okay, so this is the end of part two. And we can conclude that Joanna remains faithful. Um, we can also see that God does not necessarily compensate with material success. And so that leads us to our self-examination question. How do I respond when I feel I have been applying effort and then more obstacles come my way? Do I remain trusting of God or do I quit and give up? So the little tip here is that it's important for us to re resist feeling punished or victimized and redefine pain and struggle as believing that God is believing in our readiness to progress. Can someone please read? In the year 68, when the persecutions of Christians were intensifying, we find in one of the recurring spectacles of the circus, an old disciple of the Lord tied to the pole of martyrdom next to a young man who was her son. Before the clamor of the people, the first floggings were ordered. Abjur ex exclaims an executioner carrying out his imperial orders with a grim and gloomy look. But the former disciple of the Lord contemplates the sky without a word of complaint or of denial. Then the lash, of fl the lash flutters over the half naked boy who tearfully exclaims, Repudiate Jesus, my mother. Do you not see we lost it all? Abjure for me, who is your son. For the first time, the eyes of the martyr had become an abundant spring of tears. 
the sun's solicitations were sw swords of anguish, anguish that shattered her heart. Abjure, abjure. So the word abjure means to reject and rep repudiate means to deny truth. So as we understand, Joanna is a woman of true faith. Neither of these were an option. Can someone please read? Joanna, Joanna? Heard, Joanna heard those cries while recalling her whole existence, the cheery and festive home, the hours of bliss, the domestic troubles, the maternal emotions, her husband's failures, his despair and his death, her widowhood, her grief, and the toughest demands. Then, before the desperate pleas of her little boy, she recalled that Mary had also been a mother. Seeing her Jesus crucified on the cross of infamy, Mary learned to abide by the divine designs. Above all her memories, the most supreme joy of her life was still when she heard the master in Peter's house saying, go daughter, be faithful. So taken by superhuman strength, the widow of Jusa contemplated the first bloody victim and addressing the young boy with a deep and inexpressible gaze in her pain and tenderness, she firmly said, be quiet, my son. Jesus was pure and did not disdain the sacrifice. Let us know how to suffer in the painful hour because above all transient happiness of the world, we must be faithful to God. Thank you. I'm glad somebody else has to read this because I can never get through those two pages without crying. <laughs> so um, again, we, we, we see that this, this woman is firmly established in the first commandment, faithful to God above all else, no, you know, hands down. Um, but what we also come to learn is that not only does she have true faith, but she has what Kardec calls divine faith. And in the gospel, according to uh, Spiritism, chapter 19, item 12, Kardec describes divine faith uh, when, someone, when one applies their faculties to spiritual needs and future aspirations. They recognize the world as transient. And she certainly, I mean, mm, I don't know, as a mom watching my son in flames, I, you know, you, you have to really be able to have a divine faith. We also see, you know, it says superhuman strength. So we can believe she was being assisted. Um, we also see again, resignation. She's, she's definitely thinking with her heart. Um, she knows because I, I'm sorry, I don't know any woman thinking with her brain is gonna, you know, allow their child to go up in flames. I, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it's, um, I, I would have a hard time wrapping my head around that. So what we can know though is Joanna, um, uh, also again in the gospel, uh, let's see. Um, oh yes, in, no, it's actually in the spirits book. St. Augustine uh, talks about um, that parenthood is both a mission and a duty. And that, you know, um, that parents should be guiding their children toward the good. So we can see, you know, um, the, you know, the idea that she was going to repudiate or abjure, it, it just was really not an option of, you know, this woman with true divine faith, you know, she's, um, you know, and, and besides, what, what kind of a message, you know, she's 
um, with divine and true faith that I say to my child, oh, but if you're, you know, if you're being tied to a pole, it's okay to renounce God, you know, but otherwise you can have true, you know, no, it, it, um, that wasn't, that wasn't happening. But um, it's a, it's a, it's a strong message, um, uh, you know, that above all else, you know. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, can someone read this last slide? I can. At that time, to the delirious applause of the people, the executioners set fire onto the firewood soaked in flammable res resin around her. Within moments, the flames licked her aged body. Joanna, wife of Cusa, serenely contemplated the crowd of people who did not understand her sacrifice. The muffled groans of pain died in her oppressed chest. The executioners of the martyr surrounded her with insults. Has your Christ only taught you how to die? Asked one of the executioners. Focusing on her resilience, the old disciple still had the strength to whisper, not just to die, but also to love you. At that moment, she felt the comforting hand of the master gently touching her shoulder, and she heard the loving and unforgettable voice, Joanna, take heart, I am here. So we can conclude that this um, incarnation for Joanna was a trial. Uh, in the gospel, uh, chapter 14, item nine. It's another message by St. Augustine. And it's a pretty long message. So I just took out the part that I, uh, I think pertains to this um, story. As he says, of all the trials, those that affect the heart are the hardest. But with moral courage, one can understand ignorance as the cause and be certain that despair doesn't last forever. So as we know, all things are passing. He goes on to say that God doesn't want us to suffer eternally. It's important for us to change ourselves though first. And he says, in order to do this, we can't keep our gaze from an earthly perspective. He says, we need to look from an immortal viewpoint because then we can understand what feels like monstrosities on earth is but scratches from us when we look from a spiritual perspective. And clearly, you know, we can take this story and apply that. I mean, you know, it's from a, as a mom, I just have an incredibly hard time with this story. It's, it's really um, heart, it's heartbreaking. Um, we can also see that Joanna certainly demonstrates resilience, which is defined as adapting well in the face of adversity, tragedy, and trauma, which she faced all three of them. <laughs> um, but my final conclusion here is that we can now really understand why, why a whole chapter in this book was devoted to this beautiful spirit. She truly exemplified what Jesus taught her. No question, hands down. You know, and I think about the stories with the apostles and they, you know, were questioning Jesus and debating and why, and even at the last supper, just, you know, who was gonna get to be in charge. And this woman, you know, Jesus spoke to her and she went with it, you know, so truly an elevated spirit. Um, and we all know her as Joanna G. Angelis and with beautiful books and beautiful teachings for all of us. So I'm really hoping, I know someone had a question, so um, we can definitely address that. But I'm also really hoping, I'm sure many of you have read this in Portuguese and have attended many studies. So I'm hoping people will be willing to share um, other things they've learned from the story. So again, thank you all so much for this opportunity. 
um, it was it was illuminating to do, to work with this story. And I'm so grateful for COVID because I had a hard time with this story. I would read it and read it, and I I was okay till that whole thing about the kid on fire. I was like, I'm going to have to give this story back. I just can't wrap my head around this. And I'll be honest with you. Um, I would think about it like every other day. How am I going to talk about this? And I was driving one day to pick up my son, ironically, at the bus station. And I'm in my car and I'm, and I'm again thinking, you know, what, you know, how, how can I understand this? How can I understand really of, you know, my child, you know, like to, to, to hold back from saying I abjure, you know? Um, and I really, I was inspired. I just, you know, this kind of inspiration of listen to the words of the song. And I had the radio on, of course, driving in the car. And so I was like, oh, what, what's the song saying? And the words to this song were, all my pain divides in listening to my heart. And it sunk. This woman was listening to her heart. And it made sense to me, it clicked. Um, I can't do that with my logic and reasoning and my earthly mind, but if I'm able to see myself as a spirit, it does make it, it, it makes more sense to me and I can under, better understand it. So.